Welcome to lecture nine. Today, so in the first part, I will give you a hands-on example on how to apply linear SVM to solve um, a real problem. And in the second part, we will look at how can we use linear SVM to classify nonlinear, uh, nonlinearly distributed data. So this is like, um, we will learn specifically about the kernel trick uh, which is uh, very popular in um, classifying nonlinear uh, data. And in the third part, we will look at multi class classification. So, if we have uh, different samples drawn from multiple classes with more than two labels, how can we classify them? And this is quite interesting because we will look at how can we generalize SVM to nonlinear problems. So, SVM is very powerful. Actually, there are books, like whole machine learning books solely dedicated to SVM. So, uh, and also how can we use um, linear SVM or any linear classifier to generalize it to multi-class classification problems. And the last part, it will be just, you know, I'll give you um, a simple um, introduction to how to evaluate classifiers. So we'll learn about accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. But there are many, many uh, uh, evaluation metrics uh, and measures, but we're gonna look at those specifically uh, today. Okay, just a brief recap, what we have learned uh, in the previous lecture in lecture eight. So what we're looking at is like, uh, we're looking at classification problems. So what we have, we have uh, a training data set with uh, N samples and um, N labels. So the label uh, YI belongs to minus one or uh, negative one or one. So we have two classes, it's a binary classification problem. And uh, we defined what we call the criterion for correctly classifying samples uh, using margin perceptron. And actually, here, if you guys remember, there is an important note I would like to make um, in this um, recap. So if you remember, if we have, let's say, two classes, right? So these can be videos, images, like uh, brains, medical data, like uh, it can be anything, right? Uh, so we want to classify them. So we want to find this, um, estimate the parameters for this hyperplane, xtw plus b equals zero. But when we define the margin perceptron, we introduced what we call a um, margin. But if you remember, we translated each hyperplane by plus one, and minus one, and, okay, let me just do that. And when we did this, we found that, so this is, you know, the first hyperplane, so x transpose w plus b equals one, and then x transpose w plus b equals minus one. So after figuring out all the maths uh, for support vector machines, we found that the margin is uh, here, is equal to one divided by w. Is that right? Did we, um, that's exactly what we wanted, right? So that's that's the margin that we uh, wanted to um, maximize, but here we have a two, right? So we have a two divided by uh, the norm of w, which is the normal vector to, um, to the hyper uh, plane. So right there, this will be one, divided by the norm of W. Now, what I would like you to keep in mind that when we derive this, okay, we uh, hypothesize that the translated versions, the two streets, okay, the two hyperplanes, they are translated by plus and minus one, okay? Now, there is a more general case where we can translate the hyperplanes by plus minus a value or a scalar M. So we can just, you know, move them a little bit maybe down, okay, or up. So this is, you know, let's say the general case. So this will be equals to m minus m. And, you know, this is what we call the general case. We can solve it. And when we solve it, we will see that there would be an m floating around here in this margin. So because now it depends on m, okay? But I would say it is customary to set m to 1. So you guys can keep this in mind. It's the simplest case. But the general case, we can, you know, like translate them by a you know, a specific uh, distance, okay? Great, so 
Later on, when we looked at the uh, constraint optimization problem for SVM, we defined the Lagrangian based on the contours. So we saw the uh, geometric interpretation uh, of, the, um, of the problem. Then we translated that into um, a functional that we defined. Right here is a Lagrangian. So this is our loss function. So we want to minimize the, the uh, we want to minimize the norm, half of the squared norm of uh, W, which means maximize the margin. And we uh, subtract the, the constraints, okay? So we have all these uh, constraints. And we introduce um, uh, the um, Lagrangian multipliers, the alphas. Now, after that, we can just expand this one. So we expanded it. So this is, you know, another way of writing it down when, after expanding the, norm, uh, the uh, sum, okay? And we got this. Now, to solve this constrained optimization problem, there are two steps that you guys need to keep in mind. So the first step, this is, you know, called solving the primal minimization problem. So here, what we want to do, we want to minimize the Lagrangian. Okay, so let me use another. We want to minimize the Lagrangian, okay? But over what? Over the space of the primal variables, which, we, which are the original variables um, of our model. So w and b and we exclude we just exclude what we call the new variables that we introduced the lagrangian multipliers okay and to do this we know that we need to compute the partial derivatives with respect to the primal variables and set them to zero so when solving these two systems because here we have two uh, variables so w which is a vector and b which is a scalar uh, we solve this and we got Interestingly, so this happened here, but it doesn't happen all the time. We got an explicit form of W star, okay, which is the optimal uh, parameter we're looking for. And we found another constraint that we derived from the second partial derivative, okay? Now, what you guys need to keep in mind that when solving this primal problem, we have basically introduced two new um, um, two new constraints or equality so we discovered something okay so these are the derivatives of solving this primal minimization problem now what we're going to do next is the next step will be to solve what we call the dual maximization problem so this is the dual maximization problem how to do that so we want now to maximize the Lagrangian multipliers over the alphas, but of what? Of the Lagrangian, which was updated using these two constraints. So we change basically the uh, for like the formula for the uh, Lagrangian by using these two conditions. And you guys remember we have when we have done that, uh, we got like um, the explicit form of the Lagrangian, which is this one. Okay, and this is you know we have updated the Lagrangian by integrating the constraints 1 and 2, okay, that were discovered when solving the primal problem. So once we update this and we explicitly write it down, next would be to maximize over all alphas, okay? And this will lead us to finding the optimal alpha stars that will lead to the perfect solution that we're lo looking for, to the good, like the um, uh, optimal uh, solution, one of the optimum. So uh, there, there might, they're not always unique. Okay, there isn't a unique solution. So here, why we're doing this? So there is uh, what we call the kuhn ducker theorem, and this basically showed that solving this problem, the first one, is equivalent to solving, you know, um, the second problem. So there are like, you know, uh, this duality. Uh, is very helpful uh, on a mathematical level. Why is that? So one would think, okay, I have gotten the W star. Why I don't just keep minimizing this, okay? I can keep minimizing this and try to find the alpha directly, like just explicitly, you know, derive L with respect to alpha, and I would compute it explicitly. So one, uh, one of the drawbacks of doing that is you will have the W and the B tagging along, okay? So the idea was we want to get rid of all the W's and the B's, and then once we have this explicit form, then it turns out that when we maximize it, we, we get the alpha. So there is a lot of mathematical background on this and demonstrations, but what I would like you to keep in mind that 
these steps, first defining the primal minimization problem, then once solving it, using the constraints to update the Lagrangian, okay? Once you update the Lagrangian, you get the new Lagrangian with the, const the new constraints, right? You, then you maximize it uh, over the space of the Lagrangian multipliers. That's the main idea. So once you do that, so remember, when we want to maximize or minimize, we need to also, you know, compute the partial derivative and set it to zero. And after that, we uh, got the solutions, so the uh, alphas. So we discovered, we didn't solve it like manually, but today we will do. But here, what you will get, you will get a system of linear equations that you just need to solve uh, using a tool in MATLAB or manually solve. And one, once you do that, you will be able to derive all the alpha stars, like all of your uh, multipliers. Okay, so we discovered that alpha i will be strictly uh, positive for support vectors, and alpha i will take zero so for, for non-support vectors. So this is very important because it, it tells us that our solution here, right, so it tells us that the w, um, how, you know, we can explicitly compute it now because we have the alphas without you know, estimating the alphas, we can't have our W, okay? And also we noted that the W depends on what the training data. So now let's look at the um, a real example, hands-on, and see how the W gets affected when changing the, um, the training samples.